I wanted to talk to you about oligarchy and fascism. In my opinion, oligarchy and fascism are, are basically two words to describe the same thing. Fascism is a modern form of oligarchy. But, you know, and in fact, the word was theoretically invented by Mussolini in the 1920s. And although Giovanni Gentile is actually probably the guy who came up with it. He was uh, Mussolini's ghostwriter. But the idea of fascism is basically the merger of corporate and state interests. And Ganesh Sitaraman has a fascinating article in The Guardian today in which Ganesh is looking at two different books on oligarchy and, and literally books on oligarchy from the Greek era, which is where the word, literally the word was invented by the Greeks. And, you know, it means rule by the rich. And he starts out by pointing out that in a democracy, you can't literally have an oligarchy because in a democracy, the people would recognize that the oligarchs were not behaving in their best interests and would vote the bums out, which makes perfect sense. So then the question is, how is it that the wealthy control so much of our government? Right? How is it that, that big drug companies are basically running the Food and Drug Administration? How is it the big ag companies are basically running the U.S. Department of Agriculture? How is it that you know, big fossil fuel companies are running the Environmental Protection Agency? I mean, all of these things, step by step by step, all of these things go back to corporate takeover of government functions, which is the description of both fascism and oligarchy. So he looks at two books. The first is by Matthew Simonton. It's called Glass Classical Greek Oligarchy. And uh, Simonton makes several points. Number one, that if the elites want to stay in power, they need solidarity among themselves. And, you know, we're seeing this in, for example, the Koch network, where the Koch brothers bring together several hundred billionaires and multimillionaires a couple of times a year. And, and you know, they all travel in basically the same circles and uh, share a similar culture and values. And so there's, there's this elite solidarity. Uh, he notes, while the ruling class was, must remain united for an oligarchy to remain in power, the people must also be divided so they cannot overthrow their oppressors. And notes that, uh, you know, how oligarchs in ancient Greece held their power he says, they gave rewards to informants and found pliable citizens to take positions in the government. Well, how is that different than putting Scott Pruitt in charge of the EPA when Scott Pruitt is, you know, obviously a pliable guy. He's been taking money from the fossil fuel industry most of his political career, and he's been dancing to the tune of the fossil fuel industry. And now he's running the Environmental Protection Agency. This is exactly what they were describing was happening in Greece 3,000 years ago when the oligarchs took over. What those collaborators do, he says, is legitimize the regime and give the oligarchs a beachhead into the people. Because, you know, they go on TV, they go on radio, they sound very reasonable. Oh, we're trying to help out the average working man with this tax cut program. Or, or we're trying to, you know, make sure that our children are safe by cutting the EPA. And, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, lie through their teeth. But people, it's stuff people want to hear. He adds oligarchs control the public spaces and the livelihoods to prevent the people from organizing. This is in ancient Greece. What do we have today? You got, was it Zuccotti Park? It was one of the parks in New York that Occupy took over. Uh, turns out it was owned by a private corporation and they kicked him out. The, the public spaces around the United States increasingly are being owned by oligarchs. And in fact, that's Ryan Zinke's major project is to take public lands and privatize them, sell them off to the oligarchs. And livelihoods, he says, you know, the way that oligarchy holds its power is by the oligarchs controlling the livelihoods of the people. Well, you know, when you allow this massive consolidation that we've had since Reagan stopped enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1982, when you, when you look at that massive consolidation, what do you see? Smaller and smaller number of companies controlling a larger and larger number of workers. You know, for every Walmart that goes into a community, on average, according to some studies, 100 to 120 local businesses go out of business. So instead of 120 potential employers or actual employers that the people in the community have, it becomes one. 
and that one employer won't allow a union. In fact, the one Walmart that voted to unionize in Canada, Walmart shut the store down. So this is, you know, another example of how oligarchs control the populace. They also tried to keep ordinary people dependent on individual oligarchs for their economic survival. And he talks about how the fragmentation of our media platforms is a modern instantiation of dividing the public sphere, or how employees or workers are sometimes chilled from speaking out. The most interesting discussion, he notes, this is in the article uh, by Ganesh Sitaraman in The Guardian today, the most interesting discussion is how ancient olig oligarchs used information to preserve their regime. They combined secrecy and governance with selective messages, messaging to targeted audiences, which is exactly what Trump is doing. And in fact, you know, the whole, the whole Robert Mercer and his company, you know, and those, the, uh, the or companies that, that do all this sorting and, and finding individual voters and Cambridge Analytica and all this, this is how they can, at the same time, these oligarchs sought to destroy monuments that were symbols of democratic success. Now, what would be a symbol of democratic success? Oh, the interstate highway project, public roads, public bridges, transportation, um, anything dedicated in the name of the people. And instead, what the oligarchs did is they made sure that very little money was being spent on supporting the people by the government, but they themselves turned to philanthropy. The result, the people would appreciate the elite spending on these projects and the upper class would get their names memorialized for all times. After all, who could be against oligarchs who show such generosity? And then the other book that he looked at was Jeffrey Winter's book, Oligarchy. And he says that the key to oligarchy is to set, have a set of elites, that the, the elites have enough material resources to spend on securing their status and interests. Part of that is a property defense, which means pushing for low taxes. At its core, he writes, oligarchy involves concentrating economic power and using it for political purposes. He talks about four different kinds of oligarchies and all this sort of stuff, but basically that's, that's the bottom line. Well, this is what Vice President Henry Wallace said back in 1944 about American fascists. He said they claimed to be super patriots, but they would destroy every liberty guaranteed by the Constitution. They demand free enterprise, but they are the spokesman for monopoly and vested interests. Their final objective toward which all their deceit is directed is to capture political power. So they're using the power of the state and the power of the market simultaneously. Hold on. This is the Tom Hartman Program. So that using the power of the state and the market simultaneously, they may keep the common man in eternal subjection. 